chest check. Yeah, it's really, like, but it seems like it's a little hot. Yeah, it sounds a little hot. All right. Hey, so are we broadcasting? We are broadcasting. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the July meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society. My name is Lawrence Moore, and I'm glad to see everyone here tonight, and I'm happy for any of us that are joining us online that you're with us, too. Um, just to know, due to some hardware issues with the uh, broadcasting equipment here at Space Place, um, we're only going to be able to show you the desk, the computer desktop and uh, slideshow of our presentation tonight and we don't have a video camera going so we apologize for the technical glitches. Um, just wanted to first off uh, for those of us who uh, joined us at uh, the picnic at Yana Research Station last Saturday I'd just like to thank everyone who showed up and brought a dish to share. Um, uh, a number of people joined us a couple, few weeks ago to do a cleanup day, and uh, everyone that joined us for that, uh, your work really paid off, and we really had a nice afternoon out there. Um, I'd also wanted to thank uh, Walter and Kathy Piorowski, who uh, brought out a nice, very nice solar telescope, and everyone got some great views of the sun. And um, also Chris Zeltner uh, and Martin Mika helped a lot as far as organizing organizing and i'd like to especially thank chris for bringing us all the the food the brats hamburgers and uh chicken and also for uh to kevin santulas for grilling operating the grills it got a little smoky there but <laughs> it was and it was a great time and yeah, I, I had several really great side dishes along with the food and it was, it was just great hanging out with everyone and i also like to thank Okay, we finally got the second the second uh, storm door installed on the clubhouse. So, uh, it's made enough is gonna. I'd like to thank Dave for putting in a little extra elbow grease before the picnic. I kept on hearing about that month after month. So we got it done. All right. So um, coming up a week from tonight, we are having a special event that I would like to thank the people that have volunteered so far for that. We have cocktails in the cosmos at. Uh, uh, Monona Terrace. We're going to be up on the roof there. Um, this is a little different than our past Moon Over Monona Terraces, where this is a $20 uh, paid in advance ticket um, uh, for some stargazing and some cocktails. Um, for th this is also going to be a little different that we're going to have a smaller number of telescopes, but we're going to have everybody uh, pointing at different objects in the sky and then, you know, uh, and so that way, you know, uh, there'll be kind of a nice variety of uh, things for our guests to see. Um, if you're interested, in, if anyone here is help, interested in helping out on that, uh, please email me. I think we're in pretty good shape for telescopes. I did hear from the UW Astronomy Club that they were going to be able to send us a couple of volunteers, but I haven't heard back from them yet. Um, that's a week from tonight. And it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna run since uh, sunset. The sunset's a little bit later, so the the event is gonna run from nine o'clock until midnight. And for those of you that have contacted me and are gonna help out, I'm gonna be sending out uh, additional information on that early this week because I'm hoping to get the load-in instructions from from Monona Terrace, and I also want to finalize the target assignment list for all the telescopes before they're due on Monday. Um, so, oh yeah, so uh, just keep in mind, this is a, a ticketed event. So if you go to the Monona Terrace website, um, you can uh, find uh, 
the cocktails in the cosmos there and uh, find the link to purchase tickets in Eventbrite. And I think the last time I looked, it looked like uh, 70 out of the 100 tickets had sold. Um, I, my memory for numbers is a bit fuzzy, so it's there could be uh, fewer tickets available than that as of now. Um, was that your question here again? All right. Um, any other questions on cocktails in the cosmos? Very good. Um, I guess Jim had an announcement that he wanted to uh, share with us. Right. Oh, sorry about this. This is a little awkward. Let's see here. All right. Yes, I just wanted to, to mention that the uh, Space Place guest speaker in August, on the evening of August 8th, will be Dean Regas from the Cincinnati Observatory, who some of you may have met before. He's been through town. He occasionally passes through town, and then I try to catch him to give a talk when he does. He specifically asked if we could arrange after his talk, so that's Tuesday, August 8th at 7 p.m., if we could open Washburn Observatory for MAS after um, the, um, uh, uh, his talk here. So we'll be doing that. We'll be opening Washburn Observatory probably like you know as quick as we can get down there, maybe 8.30 on Tuesday, August 8th after his talk here. So of course, you're obviously invited here. If we can get the technology working, we'll be live streaming his talk. Uh, and then we will uh, open the observatory for a while, probably weather independent, uh, it gets too complicated. So if anybody hasn't been there and just wants to see the place, that's fine too. Um, so Tuesday, August 8th, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, beware, he is pushing a new book, which has the title something like, how to explain to your parents that Pluto is not a planet. I think that's what it was. Something like that, and the talk will be on the theme of Pluto. So, uh, so that's uh, next month, then August, Tuesday, the eighth. Thank, Thank you very much, Joe. That sounds very like a lot of fun. All right, uh, I guess I see a lot of familiar faces. I don't, I don't, I think everybody who's here, we don't have any new faces that have never joined us before, so we'll skip that normal segment of the program. I I think I heard a lot of, uh, for those of us who are not at Space Place right now, there's a lot of, been a lot of enthusiastic chatter about the movie Oppenheimer coming out. So uh, <laughs> maybe some next month we'll have a little something to talk about. We did a field trip for Apollo 11. Yeah, yeah, we did. Field trip. <laughs> you, uh, if people are interested, I, I mean, we did that last time. We rented uh, an entire uh, theater right. for Apollo 11. Yeah. Uh, so we And just to follow up, I guess uh, somewhat it's been posited as a suggestion that uh, for those of us who were in the club back when the Apollo 11 documentary movie came out, um, we did a bit of a field trip and a, we rented out a theater room at a, a high, not High Point, not High Point Cinema, is that High Point? My, yeah, high, yeah, High Point. Marcus Point, there it is. Um, we just had the whole room to ourselves and enjoyed the movie, so... And maybe we'll kick that idea around and get uh, a group activity going. If people are interested, you know, the viewing public at home, uh, have them say so in the chat. Yeah, uh, for those of us in the chat, you know, uh, feel free to type in the chat if that sounds like a good idea to you. So uh, we'll get kind of an idea of the enthusiasm. It costs sounds, money. It costs money, yeah. So you need to, you know, have a certain critical mass. Right. I think, yeah, we had kind of a certain number, a minimum number of tickets to buy in last time, and we ma managed to we handle it. We, we came out ahead, so. How much, how much was it? How much did you charge for that? I don't remember the exact numbers. I think the whole theater cost four or 500 bucks. Yeah. yeah. We came in a little ahead. We made it, you know, we brought in like 600 bucks. Yeah, last time, yeah, yeah, last time we had to sell about four to five hundred dollars worth of tickets to break even, and I imagine it's Possible those rates may have come up, or maybe they've come down because uh, I think people, some people are still a little reluctant. Yeah, John, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> yeah, it could it could be so, um, but as far as the going rates, or generic rates for running a theater room on say a Thursday night or something like we did last time, there's a generic meeting rate for that. Yeah. Yes, you're sure, I saw something that, that there was a preview of the movie Oppenheimer, and the stars were there, and they walked out because of the strike. Yeah, I don't know. 
All right, so that's your entertainment news for this month. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. All right. Um, does anybody else have any interesting news? Oh, yes, you're going to. Oh, I, I heard there's an update on the construction at Yana Research Station. One other thing you're going to. Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the exact date. The, uh, uh, I talked to the contractors, and they said right now, weather permitting, uh, they're going to start the work out at YRS on Monday, August 21st. And that will take, YRS is going to be down for a while because we have to water the grass afterwards. So it'll probably be a couple of weeks that you're going to have to suffer. You can probably set up after they're finished in the parking lot if you want to go out there um, in the parking area. But the other thing I wanted to say was um, because of the timing here, uh, we need the information for those people who want names on their pads, who bought pads uh, essentially and also for a plaque we're going to put in. So I'm going to be sending out an email tonight or tomorrow night for all the people who have uh, contributed money and uh, will show up on either the plaque or on the pads uh, asking for their information of what they want. And if things get too long, um, then we're going to have to have some conversations with people. Uh, so we need that information pretty quickly, though. Thanks. Thank you very much for the update, Jurgen. All right, I guess it, I see that it is 7.30. Um, John, would you like to introduce tonight's speaker? So before uh, I introduce Chris, uh, just a word about next month's meeting. The uh, August meeting, our guest speaker will be a UW professor named Patrick Fry. Um, some of you that I've talked to in the past, we, we frequently talk about the fact that UW's astronomy department is very, um, uh, they're oriented toward things outside of the solar system. Stellar astronomy, galactic astronomy, cosmology. There's very little that happens in the UW department inside the solar system. Patrick Fry is from space sciences and engineering, and he's one of the few people who actually does work on solar system objects. So Patrick's talk... Uh, he hasn't given me a specific title yet, but he and his group had some proposals out for the James Webb Space Telescope that we were talking about back when James Webb was first launched. I'm expecting him to actually maybe even have some observations. But he's going to talk a little bit about James Webb from the technology standpoint, what's expected of it, and what some of the results have been. So, uh, and Jupiter observations, I believe. So come back next month and we'll actually talk about an object in the solar system for a change. Um, just a word on the Oppenheimer movie. I wanted to caution you uh, that if you do, you know, rent the theater, be sure that you make cap because you don't want to have to deal with a fallout if we, if we don't. Uh, so tonight's speaker, Chris Draves. Chris is standing over here. Chris, as you can see from his slide, works for Teledyne, the largest camera company you've never heard of. Chris has spent most of his career in professional imaging technology, uh, camera and sensor technology, most of which I think never makes it to the consumer market. Uh, but the work that they've done uh, exists on the Hubble Space Telescope, the Mars rovers, the James Webb, and so forth. So Chris is going to talk about the state of the art in imaging technology and maybe what's going to trickle down to the cameras that we can buy during the next decade. So please welcome Chris Draves. Can you hear me? Okay, got it working. Okay, I'm just going to grab one thing out of my bag. I have one little prop. Somewhere in here. Oh, did it? Oh, boy. Okay. Wouldn't you know? There we go. And boom. Okay, thank, thank you everybody. Um, again, yeah, my name is Chris Traves, and um, this is my second uh, talk I've done for uh, the Madison Astronomical Society. I was here in 2015. Um, worked for a different company then, but at that time we were talking about CCDs, CCD architectures, and some of the things how CCDs work. Um, since then, uh, I've, I've had a few other stops in my career, and um, I'm currently, uh, oops, 
don't know if that was me or I'm currently at a company called Teledyne Imaging. So just a little about me. Um, I've had uh, 20 years in the scientific camera industry, and I've been both in on the sales side, and I've also been a product manager, um, you know, working on new product development and things like that within the company. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the leading brands in um, uh, scientific imaging. Those include Princeton Instruments and or Technology, uh, Fairchild Imaging out of Milpitas, California, uh, and or is out of Belfast, Ireland, and um, tele now Teledyne Imaging. Now, there is a little story there. Uh, Teledyne likes to buy companies, and so about three or four years ago, they went out and bought Princeton Instruments and it's uh, um, a few sister companies. So I'm actually kind of come back home and uh, I'm back with a lot of people that I used to work with. Uh, my current role is I'm on the uh, OEM team. I am kind of winding down my career. I'm, uh, I work part time now and I'm you know, kind of a consultative role with the company. Um, in the OEM team, that OEM stands for Original Equipment and Manufacturer. And uh, what we do is we work with companies that need high performance cameras, typically as detectors, and they're, they're building instruments uh, and they're gonna sell a lot of them. So uh, we sell cameras, but um, uh, you know, our cameras are dead more B2B. In fact, most of the opportunities that we work on are uh, at least a million dollars a year. Otherwise, we don't find that very interesting. Um, so um, that's a little bit uh, about what I'm currently doing and some of the background there. I am an amateur photographer, and you notice that I don't have astrophotographer on there. I have dabbled in uh, astrophotography, but I've come to the conclusion that I cannot stay up past 10 p.m. at night. And so I live vicariously through you all. Uh, I am a member of the group, and I'll tell you what, I just love the images I see on the Facebook group. Uh, and I have great respect for all of you because I know, you know, what a commitment it is, uh, you know, staying up late nights, how many images you got to get, all the processing. It's really something. And there's just some really great stuff um, on the uh, uh, MAS site. So what we're going to talk about, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Teledyne, the company, uh, from a corporate level. Uh, we're going to spill into Teledyne Imaging which is the kind of main core part of the business. Talk a little about a few um, companies that I find interesting there. Uh, we'll do a deeper dive into a couple of cameras that I think are relevant uh, to um, the group and some of the technology, some, some of the things we're doing there. Uh, then we're gonna um, jump into some of the projects that Teledyne is uh, working on, um, both it from the past and, and the future. And we'll finish off with some questions. And we're a small informal group, so you know, if as I go along, you have have anything, just root any questions, just raise your hand, and you know, I'd be happy to uh, try to try to answer. <laughs> so, uh, Teledyne. Teledyne. The formal name is Teledyne Technologies. It is a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, it is about $5.6 billion per year with 7,500 employees. And as you can see, it has four divisions, digital imaging, instrumentation, aerospace defense electronics, and engineered systems. If you look at our pie chart, you will see that 60% of that is the imaging group. And that group, this group uh, really uh, uh, grew dramatically uh, a couple of years ago with the acquisition of a company called FLIR. Anybody heard of FLIR? Yeah, so FLIR is a big company, almost $2 billion in sales uh, itself. And um, it was really a nice complimentary application, or, or excuse me, um, acquisition, because uh, they, they really gave the company um, sensor technologies throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we had some, but now it's, 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 it's quite complete. So, um, so that's a little bit about uh, Teledyne. Moving along to the digital imaging group, we cover s numerous markets within uh, digital imaging. Uh, I myself am in the scientific imaging group where uh, we have both CCD and 
CMOS cameras that we um, market to uh, physical sciences, life sciences, um, you know, both the research and OEM markets and that kind of stuff. We have a huge footprint in um, uh, um, machine vision. Yes, question. Do you have a cell phone? Uh, you know, I gave it to my wife. So I don't know if maybe. Okay, I'll put this up here. Maybe it's maybe happier here. <laughs> uh, oh, you know, I wonder if it's maybe these guys. Here, let's get rid of these. <laughs> My wife has joined me for this talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in scientific imaging. Huge footprint in the $12 billion plus machine vision market. Uh, thermo, we do, you know, you can see we've got a, quite a few different applications. Amorphous silicon, you know, those big flat panel detectors that go in NMR, huge position in that, all the way down to components. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a bad connection. I'll try to. Should I swap? I'm going to swap, excuse me. Check, check. Sound good? Okay. Question? Yeah, I was just wondering, where does that fit in this? Is that in scientific imaging or is it broken up into different areas? You know, uh, it's, it's broken up into different areas. Uh, we, uh, I think we're still sort of, they're still sort of sorting, sorting out where FLIR lives. <laughs> and it's such a business, it's such a huge business that, uh, um, you know, you kind of, you don't want to upset the apple cart too much. They already have things working. Uh, but there is a lot of collab cross collaboration between the different companies within um, within Teledyne. As an example, um, many of you remember a couple of years ago with all this supply chain nightmare. Um, it turned out that uh, FLIR had you know their purchasing department had just unbelievable connections in the semiconductor market, and really saved us uh, in some of our component acquisitions because it was tough out there. Okay, so how do you become the world's or uh, one of the world's largest imaging companies? You get out the checkbook, and you start buying companies. And Teledyne's no different. Uh, so this is a portfolio of some of the various companies uh, within Teledyne. Um, Teledyne Princeton Instruments. Uh, so as you can see, a, a, a theme emerging here. They buy the company and they say, "Okay, now we're going to put Teledyne in front of it." Um, so. Um, this portfolio of companies comprises uh, image sensor design and manufacturing companies such as E2V, uh, camera companies such as Princeton, uh, coating companies such as Acton Optics, which give us the anti-reflection coatings that we put on sensors. Uh, just a real nice collection of companies. And then there's, of course, uh, what is really of interest to this group, and that is the huge footprint that Teledyne has uh, in space and astronomy. And as you can see, if you look, go down these applications here, um, you know, a lot of a huge install base, whether it's telescopes, satellites, uh, uh, you know, planetary exploration, uh, really a nice footprint in here and a nice backlog of projects uh, that are, you know, are in the pipe right now. And of course, you know, when you start these projects, they take years and years and years. So, you know, whatever you're working on now might not actually, you know, launch for five to 10 years. So uh, it's, it's, it's quite a fascinating business. My ex, or my former boss uh, uh, also works for Teledyne and he's with Teledyne E2V and he's in the space group and does, uh, works with a lot of the, People are in custom sensors, a lot of telescopes and satellites and stuff. Pretty cool job. Okay, I just wanted to highlight a few of these companies. And, you know, as I mentioned, um, I uh, uh, really, uh, Teledyne has a philosophy that's called pixel to PC. So when we engage with customers, um, we can talk, you know, okay, what is it that you want? You want a custom sensor? We have the groups to do that. 
So um, E2V is a company that's actually based in the UK, um, and they uh, make a lot of the scientific uh, CCDs that go in the cameras for Princeton. It also does the sensors for uh, machine vision. This teledyne imaging sensors is what does a lot of the near-infrared MCT type sensors that uh, are in James Webb and that sort of thing. And then we have this CMOS group, and I don't know how they rate or how they got out, out of having Teledyne in front of their name, but they managed to do that, and they're called Anofocus. They're actually out of Spain, so it's a very, you know, diverse company with a worldwide footprint. Um, but they do some amazing stuff on the CMOS side. So, um, so we can start right there. Take it to the camera, all the way to the final solution. And again, this this just kind of emphasizes having this sensor array across um, the electromagnetic spectrum. So when you're talking about CCD CMOS, you know that's soft X-ray, ultraviolet, visible is the primary one. And then when we get into other types of sensor materials, such as in gas. Uh, or MCT, then we're in the visible, or we're in the SWIR mid-wave IR, um, and then there's solutions all the way out to the long wave IR. And you know a wide variety of sensor formats too, not just square, but uh, you know TDI sensors and the whole gamut there, and even photo photo detectors. So. Um, these groups have a long history, and of course, let's go back to Hubble. And E2V um, was actually uh, played a critical role in, in Hubble. Uh, the sensor for that, the CCD, was designed at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, but it was actually uh, manufactured in the semiconductor foundry at E2V in the UK. And they, or actually, I think this was their facility in France. They have a, a space, you know, kind of, they're, they're able to make space ready components at that facility. And so it's not uncommon for, um, you know, whether it's the JPL, European space, to work with E2V um, on their customized sensors. And of course, E2V also has their own portfolio of sensors. Uh, Teledyne, I believe, also provided a couple of uh, near infrared. Uh, cameras for this that were that you are used for sort of positioning the uh, Hubble. Then there's a, the scientific imaging group. That's my group, and again you can see up there we're, we're touting our Pixel to PC engineering and manufacturing. And um, I think this is going to be a trend uh, um, in the industry of uh, companies, you know, especially after that supply chain. Uh, debacle that really uh, um, that really riled the market, and so uh, people want certainty. So they they're looking to work with companies that have control of the complete supply chain, and um, and we're really uh, uh, seeing some success here in engaging people, um, starting at the sensor level, moving all the way through. Okay, cameras. We got tons of them. Uh, this is our CCD portfolio for Princeton. Now these are primarily used in research. Uh, probably the one that I would highlight up here is the SOFIA. And SOFIA is, uh, um, does, we do target ground-based astronomy with that. Um, and um, it's, it's that one I think is, uh, we are getting some install base out there, but it's still fairly new. Um, a lot of these other cameras are more like into your sort of physics and um, chemistry, spectroscopy, and some of these other sort of applications. Now you notice um, in the blue here, these are the sensor types, and these are all E2V sensors. So these are all uh, um, Teledyne E2V sensors right through to the Princeton Instrument camera. Whereas I move on here, and now this is our CMOS portfolio. And we're a little bit uh, op more open-minded on the types of sensors. These, these G-Pixel, G-Pixel is actually a Chinese company that um, develops a pretty good scientific sensor. Uh, and so we do have you integrate a few of those in, the, uh, in our CMOS cameras. Now, you see up there the term SCMOS. Anybody heard of SCMOS ever? 
uh, it's a little marketing thing. It means scientific CMOS. <laughs> but uh, basically, CMOS sensors for the longest time were just not up to the performance of CCDs. Um, uh, CCD, it just you know, it's it's a it, it's a wonderful device. Its disadvantage is that it has just a single readout, uh, unless it's a real large format. Maybe you get two or three readouts, but that means your frame rates are really really slow like maybe one, two frames a second. Um, so there was a desire from the market, hey, how can we get our frame rates up? And the natural thing was, we, well, we really got to move to CMOS. About 10 years or so ago, um, a, a group, uh, actually it was with Fairchild Imaging, one of the companies I worked with, actually developed the first SCMOS sensor, and that really broke the noise barrier at that point and got us down to uh, this one, 1.2 electron read noise, so just a really low read noise floor. Now, just to give you a comparison, a CCD, the lowest noise floor that you're going to get is about three electrons, and that's going to be at the slowest readout speed. Now we can, we can read out at much, very fast and have a very low noise floor, and now we're getting video frame rates, and, and as a result, a lot of these CMOS cameras are, are overtaking CCDs in, in a lot of the applications. Um, you notice in here also uh, we have a couple of Sony sensors. And uh, the, here's the thing about uh, uh, cameras. And that is, is if you want to get a camera that is consumers are going to be able to afford, you're generally going to be using a Sony uh, sensor because they own the, all the volume. Uh, and that's what it's all about. We make CCDs with E2B, but the volumes are such that the price of the sensors is just super, super expensive. So, um, so we need cameras at you know maybe four or five K for us. That's cheap. Um, uh, then we, we go to use uh, Sony sensors. They're great sensors. Uh, the other thing I'll say that's a little bit different about our cameras versus what you might find on the commercial side is a lot of our cameras have to go into systems like boxes, you know, and they're just like sealed up, stuck in a lab somewhere, and uh, they got to run 24 hours a day. And so all the components, everything has to be specified as a kind of an industrial grade. So all the components in it are more expensive. And that drives up the price and makes it just really not practical uh, for the consumer world. Where uh, I did kind of look, survey the market of what's like Wow, I think is um, one of the companies that makes makes detectors out there, and I think ATEC. Uh, you know, they're they're definitely making a move into CMOS there, but they're able to use more consumer grade components, and that allows them to keep the price down. Okay, let's drill down a little bit on a couple of cameras. Now, first thing is, um, I sort of picked this one because uh, who knows what major announcement happened in 2018 that sort of turned the world upside down. Okay, I will, go, I will let you know. Uh, Sony announced that they were exiting CCDs. And that was a really, really, really big deal. Um, because especially for people that need long exposure, the CCDs are great for long exposures. And so uh, Sony came out in 2018 and announced, look, hey, we're done with, we're going to be done with uh, CCDs. Uh, we're going to give you seven years. Uh, and they went out to all their big customers, us included, and it said, we need a seven-year forecast of what you're going to need. So we went out and got our seven-year forecast. We multiplied it by 10, and then we gave it back. And then uh, what happened was is uh, Sony just blasted out, made all those CCDs, and we've just been pulling off of that. Well, guess what? 2025, they're done. Um, and so this created a challenge for companies like us, like companies that serve uh, the astrophotography market, how do you go with a new product? How do you go with a CCD and a new product in 2023 or 2024 when, when you know, the, the, part, the main part we use is CCD is, is going obsolete? Well, we really had to move 
to the, the needle a little bit and go to a cooled CMOS camera. And something we had to challenge our engineering staff to say, hey, we need these CMOS cameras to be able to do long exposures. And so for us in my group, we work in a long exposure application called chemiluminescence. And of course, a lot of you probably um, do long exposures for uh, collecting images, I'm sure. Um, we have customers that with our CCDs need to take an hour exposure. And so um, uh, our, we set our team loose on coming up with this new camera, which we did called the E7 Retiga. And um, for the first time, I got to say, in my career, they actually got it right, right out the gate. You know how the, the, there's always a new camera, you get it, and then there's like 10 firmware updates and all this stuff. They actually nailed this one, which was pretty cool. Um, but what I thought I would do is just talk about some of the uh, things to be concerned about when you are looking at long um, exposure or um, cooled CMOS. And one thing that, you, um, that happens with CMOS when you start to uh, go with a longer exposure time is you can get this thing called glow. So the electronics basically start heating up and you can actually see that in the image. And so what design teams need to do is come up with new routines of either controlling how they're turning on and off the um, you know, different, different areas of the sensor uh, to reduce that glow reduction. So this is, a, this is sort of a different noise source that you're fighting with uh, when you're talking about with, a, with a, these types of cameras and long exposures. The other thing, of course, is um, with the CMOS cameras, each pixel has its own readout electronics, right? So uh, that's what gives us those fast, faster frame rates is, is we, you know, everything has its own uh, uh, readout, ADD, and so we uh, need more corrections that we're able to apply for dark frames, for pattern noise. And um, these are the kinds of things you want to uh, think about or consider when you're looking at these cameras on the market. Um, I think our team did a great job with the, uh, these challenges. Um, the last thing, of course, is we're talking about cooling. And um, I've seen, like, I, I've seen that in some of these uh, Astronomy cameras, they are having cooled CMOS. So, so that's, that's a good thing. As I mentioned, you know, a little bit different with us is uh, we have to, we have a really, really solid cooling technique, te uh, um, technology, but it has to be, you know, when you're sticking a camera in a box and then sending it to the South Pacific and it's going to run in some lab there for 24 hours, it just can't fail. So we put a lot of effort into that. I've noticed, um, you know, with some, I was kind of reading some of the user manuals and some of the um, commercial cameras in astronomy. Um, they might, um, they have cool CMOS, but they might have like dust compacts you have to change or things like that. I think that's okay, uh, but it's, you know, it's something to consider. Uh, what what are they doing for cooling and how how solid is it? Because in the end. We, this is what we love, is that just nice flat image. At least in the scientific world, we get really excited when we see images like this. Now you notice this one here, these were tests, so we're not doing real long exposures here. But we have this camera in the field now, and people are doing our exposures, and it's just working great. Does anybody have one of the a cool CMOS camera? Okay, I see they're out there, so. They're out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> but I think that that's probably, that would be a technology that I think is going to come down in price. So keep an eye out for that. And these are some of the things that you want to be aware of. Now, um, you know, in my career, I, uh, especially when I was in sales, I worked out of, out of Madison here. And I covered all the Big Ten schools. And you saw the camera portfolio that I would go to talk to customers with. And I could talk to people in physics, and I could talk to people in life science labs and chemistry. We talked about spectroscopy and imaging. Um, but there was that darn astronomy group up there. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I loved going up there, but it was, it was always frustrating to me, because you might be getting somebody who's interested 
in a camera and they would get you all excited talking about all the great things they're going to do and by the way it's going to be in a telescope in Chile and it's like that's not in my territory can I just ship it to you and you can carry it on your luggage and uh, but it turns out that here's the deal with how do you sell a camera to uh, one of these large telescopes around the world it's a really complicated process and the one thing I've been impressed with uh, uh, Teledyne um, and one of my colleagues his name is Tim Brickman he helped me with this presentation his job is he's the business development guy for astronomy for us and he travels all over the world sort of finding out, okay, how is this thing working? Because see, it could be a professor at the University of Wisconsin that calls and says, I'm part of a group, we're interested in the camera, we're looking for this, but we're gonna put our camera in South America, and oh, it's gonna be paid for by the Italian government. So it's a very complicated transaction. You need somebody to sort of follow that all through before it actually happens. It's very, very complex. But that didn't stop us from trying to create a new camera, so we did. Um, and this is a, what I think is a very bold project. Uh, it's called Cosmos, and we're just um, introducing our first sensor in it. You can sort of see here at the end that iPhone next to the camera head, so you can get an idea how, how sizable this camera is. Um, now, what's significant here is uh, our management within my group, within the Princeton Instrument Group, said, you know what, we're going to go to our own CMOS team and we're going to say we want to develop our own set of sensors. And if you're going to do that, you better have a really good business plan. So we identified a few different markets, astronomy being one, and then there's another very high-end scientific market, which will remain nameless, that will be that will probably drive the business, but we need to do that because to do this kind of development is millions of dollars, millions of dollars. It takes, and it takes a bit too, because we probably started this project two or three years ago. And then they have to design the sensor, and then they have to go to the fab, and then they do a first run, and they go, is this gonna work? And then on and on and on. So we're uh, probably about two or three years. Um, we're gonna have three sensor sizes in this, uh, it's a 9 megapixel, 26 megapixel, and a 64 megapixel. Now you might think, oh wow, that's not that exciting. But um, the pixel size on these is 10 microns. So um, in our types of cameras, the pixels tend to be larger, more, more uh, generally more than twice as large as what you'd see in a typical Sony CCD, because people are trying to capture as many photons as they can. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, so you know, there's a, um, we're putting a huge effort into this, uh, both in um, the unnamed market and then in astronomy. And uh, my colleague Tim now is out uh, really talking up uh, the old cosmos here. This is uh, just so, sort of so, shows his sensor family. And this is going to be this 8K by 8K. And you can see that 4K by 4K. And I happen to have a 4K by 4K sensor right here. So you can sort of see how, how big these guys are. And, um, and uh, uh, I think this is, is pretty exciting. You know, it's also interesting that Sony mentioned that um, strategically, they're going to um, really try to move into uh, larger format sensors. They want to kind of own that space. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, what they come up with. Um, I guess one other question for the group. Um, are, is anybody familiar with uh, or heard the term stack sensor? Yeah, so that's another thing you're going to be hearing a lot about is the stack sensor. I do own a Sony camera myself. Oops. Which one? Uh, the A1. Yeah, and that has a stack sensor. And basically what a stack sensor is, is, you know, they're sort of exhausted how, how, how fast they can do things on a single wafer. So they, they, they broke it into two, right? And they, they put the kind of the photosensitive components on, on the top layer, the pixels and everything, and then the readouts on the bottom. And so like on this A1 camera, uh, this thing will do 30 frames a second um, at um, 50 megapixel. And um, I, the raw files are like 121 megabyte a piece. It's just like, it's amazing to see it pump out that much data. 
But I think that will become routine. So I think that's something that you're going to um, see is these larger format sensors uh, become more available. Okay, we've got to get a little specky. So we love uh, this thing here. It's called a quantum efficiency curve. Is anybody familiar with looking at a QE curve? If um, you ever, um, you know, are shopping for a camera and you, you find out which sensor you got, for example, on Sony, if you go and look at the actual Sony specification sheet, you, it'll show this quantum efficiency curve. And this just kind of shows the, um, you know, the sensitivity of the sensor. Um, so what we like is, is in, this is, of course, visible, but we like to get as much QE in, that, in those peak uh, 500 to 600, this is 90% QE. And I did see that Sony now has a 92% QE sensor uh, that I think we're going to look at putting in the camera next year. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the specky thing. I won't bore you with all that. Okay, let's talk about some projects. Um, so Teledyne um, has been doing a lot of press releases lately. Um, because they've been playing a role a lot in um, some of these huge, very visible projects that you, I know you all guys have all been following and have seen. Um, one I want to point out here, and that is, I've been talking about Teledyne Imaging, but actually Teledyne's bigger than that. Um, we have a group called Teledyne Brown that um, actually supports the, uh, the uh, International Space Station. So they're based at the NASA facility in Hutsville, Alabama, and they're under contract to basically run all the ground operations, training, everything like that. So uh, it's not just cameras. There's a lot of other types of components that Teledyne does that, to support these big projects. Perseverance. Um, so launched, what, in 2020. Um, isn't it great to just be able to go to YouTube and just kind of turn on Perseverance? I don't know. I kind of like to do that sometimes and just let, just watch Mars go around my TV. <laughs> uh, so Televine had a huge footprint. Uh, there's a spectroscopy system on there called Sherlock, uh, which E2V did the image sensor for. And then my company, Princeton Instruments, uh, did components for the spectrograph and then optics, or coatings for the optics. So. Coatings are really actually a pretty important thing um, for uh, you know both image sensors and and mirrors, and um, a lot of people you know sweat over whether you know it's gold or silver, or we have different kinds of inter in, um, anti-reflection coatings that we actually put on the sensor. We can sort of tweak the QE at to, as to where the max sensitivity will be. Um, Supercam, that's Teledyne E2V. We have a near infrared group called Judson. They did all the infrared diodes for this project. And then uh, DALSA uh, was, did the Skycam. Uh, one other group that I'd never heard of within Teledyne, Teledyne Energy, Energy Systems, actually did the power plant or the power supply for the Mars rover. So you can see we got our hands all over this one. And of course, there's the big one. Um, this is just such an amazing project. I know all you guys follow it. I see you know people talking about it all the time. Um, James Webb, um, maybe you've seen this timeline, you know, showing the Big Bang, the dark matter area, and then the formation of stars and galaxies. Uh, you know, here's Hubble and what it's be able able to see. And then, of course, they went to James Webb, and now they're getting all the way down to this, this dark area. So making amazing, amazing discoveries. And uh, just a sec here. Get to a little video. There we go. Sorry. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, just an animation of uh, you've you've seen this probably in James Webb uh, opening up. Uh, when you have these big telescopes, 
whether they're ground based or uh, something like James Webb, they typically have a series of instruments with them. Uh, there are four major instruments on uh, JWST, uh, four infrared instruments, and Teledyne did the sensors for three of them. Uh, the only one we didn't do was MIRI, and if we would have had FLIR, maybe we would have done that. Um, but uh, so we did the guidance system, near IR cam, which does some awesome images. And then, of course, this near IR spec. So when you hear uh, the discussions about, you know, some of the molecular findings that they're having, um, this is the near IR spec or that spe uh, spectral imaging system uh, that allows them to gather both spectral and spatial information. Um, this is just, you know, you've probably seen, you know, the, the orbit of Hubble. And then, of course, this is showing the L2 orbit of the James Webb. I got these along with the presentation, so I just had to show them here. And, um, you know, the other thing that's neat about this project, of course, is how you know, they have this sort of hot side and cold side. And when you're using these near-infrared cameras, dark current is such a, you know, major source of noise. So having the ultimate cooling for these things is just really, really fantastic. Okay. And then there's this one that just kind of throws a guy next to these things and how big they are. Um, so we talked about spectral in, uh, um, imaging, and the near IR spec was also partnered with the European Space Ag uh, Agency, and this is an optical module that they did for that. Uh, you notice there's a filter wheel on there, and um, when you're when you want to get this spectral imaging, uh, you typically capture images, uh, you know, through a series of different filters and then stack them all together. That's what gives you both that spatial and spectral information. This is kind of a cool uh, uh, animation that goes through the full beam path. And uh, I know there's some, uh, anybody in, um, who's worked with spe spectrometers or uh, anything like that, every time, every time you, that you, you're bouncing off a mirror, you're losing just a little bit of signal. And it's amazing to me um, how, many, how many bounces there are. Um, the other thing unique was this electromechanical assembly. I believe it's called a micro shutter system, which allows uh, them to gather 100 spectra simultaneously. Um, and again, that's very, very important for, um, you know, looking at these different um, spectroscopic um, components to, to these images. So this is just sort of a visual. It sort of shows, okay, so now we're going to show the spectrum here. And you can see these are the different filters and how they're able to put these together to get a completer, complete, more complete spectrum. Okay, let's dive back into these detectors. So Teledyne um, provided 15 2K by 2K MCT um, detectors. Um, and what those are, um, are a near IR, usually out to 2.5, maybe further out there, 2.5 microns. I think this actually goes out to five microns. Um, now, when you're working with these sensors that are in the near infrared, and there's two materials that I've, I've worked a lot with these, both near infrared and MCT type cameras. And to develop these sensors, you still need a silicon readout. And so what they'll do is they'll have the substrate of whatever material is gonna be the photosensitive material. In this case, it's the MCT material. Um, 
versus the, uh, uh, and then they'll bond it here, bump bond it to the silicon, and this will serve as the readout. Now, you're never going to get one of these cameras, so forget it. <laughs> and um, there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, we don't make a lot of them, so the price is like super expensive. Uh, I ran into, I think this is a te tele teleguide scientific imaging. I was at a trade show in San Francisco called Photonics West. And I was talking about to one of these guys about one of their cameras. One camera was a million dollars. Unbelievable. Um, so there's that. But the other thing is anything in the near infrared um, requires an export license. So when we sell to any universities or anything like that, we have to have them sign all this paperwork. The government tracks where each where each of those cameras are. So um, it's just I just don't see the day uh, where that's going to say, oh, it's commercially available. If there is one, is actually an infrared camera that, that becomes available, I think it would be of the in-gas variety. That one's sort of come down in price. There's a lot of applications and um, machine vision and other areas that are driving that. So eh, you never know. We'll see. And uh, this slide just really emphasizes that the amount of material on here, you know, here's a Japanese coin at one gram. They're basically using 0.75 gram of this material um, on, as far as the photosensitive area of the detector. And once we have it all together, we get that. And um, many of you have probably seen this. This is that first alignment image uh, when they got all the mirrors together. And then people started going, what's all this? And then they knew they had something pretty special. Now, um, I saw uh, maybe a week or two ago, uh, somebody had posted this image. Fantastic. Near, this is from near ARCAM of Saturn. And um, isn't it interesting? You know, the detail you're getting on the rings here, but the planet itself is kind of meh. And uh, this individual made the comment, wow, I wonder what it would be like to see an ultraviolet image. So I searched Hubble images, and sure enough, they took an ultraviolet image of Saturn. Um, so uh, the point of this is, yeah, not everything um, is active in, you know, these near-infrared wavelengths so there are going to be some dead areas sometimes so that's why it's good to have a variety of cameras that are looking um, at, at you know whatever you're trying to image okay where do we go from here anybody heard of this project yeah uh, my wife said is that nancy grace is that the one that's on C? <laughs> But uh, this, this project is slated for uh, 2027, and it's going to have 300 million pixels of uh, uh, near-infrared pixels of, that are going to be, um, you know, that Teledyne is going to support through 18 uh, NCT arrays. And um, we have delivered those arrays. So, um, you know, 2023, they've got the cameras. That's how long it takes to do all the validation and get this thing all going before they actually uh, blast, blast this thing off. But this will be the largest um, uh, near-infrared telescope then, yeah, active telescope. OK, that's it. And uh, I hope, hope you enjoyed it, got some information. And I'll open up if anybody has any questions. Yes. equipment how much of that is off the shelf how much of that is customization well I, I that's a very good question because I would say uh, in the past a majority of it was customized and there still is a lot of customized I, I mentioned to you that my boss um, works uh, for E2V and a lot of the stuff he does is custom sensors still but uh, I was really I was talking with uh, Tim, our business development guy, and 
It used to be when you went into, you know, astronomy labs or, you know, these high-end, you know, JPL, that everything was custom. But a lot of the people that were building those cameras are retiring. There's sort of a different thought process that, hey, if we, if we go with more commercial products, we can get things done faster. So uh, I think that there is, you know, and that's another justification for the risk that's being taken with that Cosmos camera is there's going to be more demand for, you know, standard cameras if they fit the bill. That said, I, I could see that, you know, there still be, you know, people will say, hey, that's a really great camera. Can we do this with it? <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Just going to say on the consumer end of it, it's just, since I've been paying attention, it's really amazing to see how Sony has kind of eaten the world. Yeah. Yeah, they have. They're, they're definitely the dominant player in sensors. And, um, and uh, I don't see that ending. Uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, I put uh, the largest camera company you ever heard of. Uh, internally, people have talked that we're probably the second largest camera company next to Sony. And we're probably way behind <laughs> what Sony is because it's just such a big camera. But if you ever look at their sensor portfolio, all the sensors they have, it's just massive. And the volumes that they sell those sensors in is just, you know, tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands. So they've got a very, very powerful footprint. There's other sensor manufacturers out there, um, but they tend to be a little bit more niche. Sony's got the broader. I mean, even though they're in the consumer space, they're selling sensors to their competitors. Yes. Canon, they're all, yes. They're all using Sony sensors in them. Yes. Yes. Um, and and part of that is is it's that justification, you know, because if if you're gonna go like um, what Nikon's got that new camera out called the um, Z8, uh, and somebody told me that the backlog on that right now is four thousand cameras. Wow. That, and that's one company. So think of you know, there's Canon, there's Sony, you know. There's a lot of people buying cameras, but if you have four thousand, you know, orders, and and then you're, you know, it's going to be four or five times that of what you're going to sell or whatever, that's probably justification to do your own sensor, okay. But if you're going to do a hundred cameras a year or three hundred cameras a year, you're going to go to Sony and you're going to source one of their parts. Yes. I'm just curious, um, when you talk about customization, the pre a previous question, there's two areas you can customize. One is the sensor and the other is the, elect the background electronics. Uh, when you talk about customization, does that include both parts? Uh, it can. Um, there, don't forget also anti-reflection coatings. Because uh, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm going to just go back here real quick to, uh, and I wish I, I I wish I would have saved this slide, but I deleted it because <laughs> uh, I, I, nobody's going to want to see that. But um, here's the quantum efficiency curve of this. This is an if this is if we did not have an anti for reflection coating on this, this would be kind of a hump that would end up at about 50 percent because uh, silicon reflects, right? So lights coming on it, and a bunch of it's going to bounce off. So we put these ref, uh, anti reflection coatings on. Uh, in order to maximize the amount of photons that we can um, capture on these things. Now, you can get coatings that will redshift out here. You can make them broad. Maybe you want to get more UV. So that's a form of customization. Um, then in the CCD, as far or yeah, in the, in the backside of the electronics, it's a lot about the readout, or it could be about the read noise, because there's trade-offs. Um, take a look at the chart right here. This kind of shows a good example. Um, and this is, this is the worlds of specmanship. Uh, if you go back to our original sort of um, shot I had of the cameras, it says uh, 0.7 electrons read noise. But one digs down, you need this 18-bit digit digitization to get the 0.7 um, elect electrons. And that means your readout is going to be pretty slow, not a lot of frame rate on there. If you want higher frame rates, you're going to have to live with more noise. So there's little tweaks and things they can do 
um, on a custom side to you know meet a customer request like that. Uh, my understanding of the Nancy Grace telescope is it's supposed to have something like 100 times the field of view of Hubble with the same resolution and it infrared only, but it could kind of be considered Hubble's replacement. Yeah, almost what? Be considered Hubble's replacement. Oh, that's, that's I mean, I, I don't think I could comment on that. Um, I'll say, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, all I can tell you is that Teledyne um, is doing the near infrared detectors for that. But um, that might be, uh, you know, that that you know they want better resolution and be able to look further back. So that would make sense. Any other questions? Oh, I guess not. There's no more questions. Okay. And it's been great seeing you again, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And this is yeah, a very fascinating uh, presentation on what's going on with imaging these days. And uh, it must be exciting to be kind of in the nexus of all the uh, chatter. Of it's very wonky. Going on, very Usually, wonky. Yeah, our group meetings are just, yeah, just like, you know, all in the weeds of, uh, you know, of specs and this and that yeah it's kind of fun and i guess there are probably a lot of projects that may you know a lot of ideas and things that kind of get the ball rolling but then it stutters and you never hear about them but yeah you know whenever um whenever you know we we have strategic meetings periodically right and a lot of companies do that and you have your sort of funnel of projects and you have your engineering resources and that engineering resources of finite set of resources. So everybody brings their bright ideas, makes their business case as to why theirs is the best thing, and then choices need to be made as to you know, what's gonna make it and what's not. And then as you are going along in the project, you may hit, you, you, you have various gates that you might hit, like, uh, okay, where are we at? Are, are, are we achieving what we said we were gonna do? And then there's times where people say, you know what, this one's not working out, or, or um, people say, you know what, this is a better way to spend our resources, and then this one gets mothballed. I imagine there are a lot of astronomers trying to book time on the James Webb, but uh, writing project proposals. <laughs> that, I think that's a, yeah, that, that's a fascinating thing with all these telescopes, is they really are large user facilities. Yeah. And uh, even I used to call it Argonne National Lab, and um, uh, that's an amazing place. It's got this giant, you know, ring with all these different sectors doing experiments, and it's a master user facility, and um, uh, that's 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 how it works. Well, very good. Then, on behalf of uh, Madison Astronomical Society, uh, I, I guess the last time you visited us. I got the mug. mug. You got a mug. <laughs> and we'd like to give you a Madison Astronomical Society. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Coming back and seeing us again. All yeah. right. Appreciate it, everybody. <laughs> well, all right. It's just about time to sign off. And I just want to quick remind everyone that our next meeting is coming up on Friday, August 11th. And we look forward to seeing everyone then.